So good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar about the risk and confocal microscope and its integration in uh, Velocity. Um, I see that there are already a few people here. Let's just wait a few more minutes to make sure that we have everyone. So in the meantime, if you have any question, you can write in the chat. I'll write the first message. If you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to write them here, and then we will answer them at the end of the webinar during the question and answer session. Let's wait maybe one more minute and then we'll uh, we'll kick off. <laughs> Hi, Jens. Okay, I think we can start. So again, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, webinar about the risk and confocal microscope and its integration into Velocity software. This uh, webinar is co-organized with uh, confocal.nl, Quorum Technologies, and Axiom Optics. Um, I will uh, start with a very quick presentation of Axiom Optics, then I will give the hand to Jeroen. Uh, Jeroen uh, is a uh, um, product application specialist at uh, confocal.nl. Then after we'll have an introduction of Quorum Technologies uh, by uh, John Abacol, CEO at Quorum Technologies. And, and Jeff Butler will take the hands and uh, run a demo of a uh, quick demo of uh, Velocity software. Then after that, Jeroen will uh, get back and show us uh, a live demo of the RISC and confocal microscope. So let's start with a quick presentation of Axiom Optics. Axiom Optics is a distributor and uh, specializing in optical instrumentation. Uh, we do several things, among which uh, we have a microscopy team uh, of three people, Philippe Clemenceau and Neshe Temaltas on the East Coast and myself on the West Coast. Among the different things we do, we have uh, four add-on systems that can transform a microscope, a wide field, typically a wide field microscope, into a system with more capabilities. The first one is the risk and confocal microscope that we're going to present today, uh, which transform a wide field into a laser scanning confocal system with super resolution. We also have the Mikao add-on for 3D single molecule localization microscopy from Imagine Optic. We also offer the toggle flim system, uh, which is a frequency domain flim system uh, using a camera. And we also recently started working with SensorCell, which is an optical tweezer platform, uh, actually optical tweezers and force measurement platform. Besides those uh, add-on systems, we also have a, a wide variety of cameras uh, from the Tuxen uh, camera, 20 megapixel CMOS camera uh, with very low noise and actually very affordable, 2200 USD, uh, to more high-end cameras, SCMOS from Hamamatsu, 
uh, the Arca Flash for the Fusion or the Lightning for applications that require more speed. And for applications that require even more speed, we offer the iCam Fluo camera from Lambert Instrument, which is a camera that can go uh, the first generation at 1.2 megapixel uh, at 1,000 frames per second. And the second generation goes basically twice, twice as fast for almost twice the field of view. And we also offer the Argo Light solution for quality control of your uh, fluorescence microscopes. With that said, I'll give the end to Yeroun, who is going to present uh, Confocornel and the Riscan Confocor microscope. Thank you, Vincent. So, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for inviting me for this uh, for this demo and presentation. So, I will take about ten minutes to uh, introduce you to the uh, uh, Riscan Confocor microscope. I'll show uh, the technology uh, comparisons with other imaging modalities some live cell imaging examples, which we acquired over the past couple of months, uh, configurations of several RCM systems. Uh, then Jeff will give a walkthrough through Velocity and I will give a live demo of the RCM in Velocity. And in between there is a Q&A session in which we can answer all your questions. So what do we do at convocal.nl? We uh, built the RCM, which is a uh, device which can be added to an existing wide field uh, platform. The RCM improves the resolution of the system, both in uh, Z and in uh, XY. And it's a very affordable uh, solution, which will actually give your system super resolution capabilities. And I will demonstrate it in the coming slides. So the main message is that you can upgrade your microscope and we can reuse existing components such as the laser and the camera. Okay, so this is uh, something that we can uh, work, that we can show. So here we have some uh, living cells. We image these for 61 hours, so really long time. And here you see on the left side the raw data from the RCM, and on the right hand side you can see the deconvolved data and Huygens. And of course, this uh, gives really sharp images. More on this later. So. How does the uh, rescan convocal microscope work? In order to understand this, you first have to uh, we first have to go back a little bit to how a regular convocal microscope works. So in a regular convocal microscope, we have the laser coming in, and then there's a dichroic mirror which separates the laser light from the emission light. Then the laser light hits the scanning mirror, is projected onto a uh, onto the uh, sample surface by an objective lens. And then the red lines here can be followed back. This is the emission light. This emission light is uh, de-scanned by the mirror, passed through the dichroic mirror, and then focused by a lens on the pinhole. After that, you will detect it with the, a photomultiplier tube or hybrid detector or anything uh, that, that's similar to that. Um, but what is a big, uh, a big, big downside of using these point detectors is that uh, they're quite insensitive. So here we can see a graph of uh, the relative sensitivities of uh, uh, gallium arsenic PMT, which is very widely used. And you can see that it has a quantum efficiency of about 20%. So it means one in every five photons will be converted into readable signal. Uh, then you have slightly better PMTs, the gallium arsenic phosphorus. So they reach up to 45, but you can also see that uh, it drops off, especially in the far red. So if you would like to use far-red probes, then a PMT that has a gallium arsenic phosphorus layer is not very good. Uh, what you can do, of course, is use a camera. And this is here indicated by the silicon photodiode. And you see that this has a much higher quantum efficiency extending over the uh, pretty much the entire range. So up to 82% maximum. And in the far-red, you still have about uh, 60 to 70%. Okay, so this is uh, where the idea from the, for the rescan focal got started. So why don't we use a camera as detector? So that's what we did. We replaced the PMT by a, a camera, and this can be a, a CCD camera or a CMOS camera. And you can basically see here, uh, the scheme represents uh, a rescanning mirror, which projects this emission light onto the camera. So we have two mirrors, the scanning and descanning mirror for the laser and emission light, and then a rescanning mirror to project this light onto the camera chip. And this was actually a PhD thesis done in uh, uh, 
published in 2013 by Julia De Luca. And you can look up the uh, reference down here. So we also, apart from uh, using a camera as detector in convocal microscopy, we also can improve the resolution with this uh, principle. And I will explain with some schem schematics how this works. So we have here on the left-hand side, uh, the laser scanning the, uh, the, the laser spot across the sample surface. And on the right-hand side, you can see the rescanner projecting the emission spot on the camera. So in this case, the scanner and the rescanner have the same amplitude. So there's nothing really special. It's like diffraction limited resolution, 240 nanometers. But since we have two scanner sets, we can play with the angular amplitude of the rescanning mirror. So what we do here is we uh, do a double sweep for the rescanner, and we can see that um, we have now twice the, uh, or actually four times the area to write over. Uh, this spot is still diffraction limited, and it's about 1.4 times, uh, has about 1.4 times the motion blur of the original laser scanning spot. And now we can use some optics to re rescale this image back. So purely by using a lens, we can rescale the image back and obtain a resolution that is, uh, is improved, namely 170 nanometers. So the resolution is improved by 40% simply by applying this scanning and rescanning technique. Okay, so these are some of the specifications of the RCM. You can uh, achieve 170 nanometers in the raw image in the lateral dimension. And after deconvolution, since this is raw data, you can still improve the resolution further to 120 nanometers. The actual resolution, so the Z resolution in the raw image is about 500 nanometers. And after deconvolution can reach 350. Then the quantum efficiency of the system, it's of course, depending on which camera you have, but anywhere between 80 and 95%. Uh, we scan at about one frame per second at 512 by 512 pixels. And if we decrease the field of view, we can go much faster than that. So very small region, we can scan several tens of frames per second. Uh, we utilize four uh, lasers. So 405, 488, 561, and 640 but we can adapt to other lasers as well. And the pinhole inside our box is fixed. There's a 50 micrometer pinhole, which is optimized for high magnification and high NA objectives. So this is a very easy to use technique as I will demonstrate in the, in the, in the demo in a few minutes. Um, so there's no post-processing involved and the 170 nanometer resolution is obtained only by using optics. So generally, users are very happy with our system because it's easy to use and generate sharp and crisp images. If you compare us to uh, other imaging modalities, here we can see uh, a sample that I've, uh, that I've imaged myself on a wide field microscope. And then uh, by marking the position, I could find back the same cell and imaged it in a, a PMT-based scanning confocal microscope. So you can see the wide field and the convocal already. Convocal is a bit sharper. Then I found back the same cell and imaged it in the RCM. And then you can see if you look closely that the uh, resolution is, 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 is uh, slightly improved. And then you can deconvolve this data and then you see that it gets even better than that. So it really shows uh, the benefit of using such a system. So some of you may know that uh, 170 nanometers can also be achieved by closing the pinhole of a regular convocal microscope. So most users use the convocal microscope at one area unit, then it's 240 nanometers, diffraction limited. But you can close the pinhole and then uh, obtain 170 nanometers in theory, but this is at the expense of about 95% of your light. So most of the light will then be blocked by this very small pinhole. In the RCM case, however, we are not dependent on the pinhole to obtain the 170 nanometer resolution. So we can have an open pinhole and therefore we get a much more light. And this is clearly illustrated in these images. If you look, uh, if you look closely, you can see that the 0.3 area unit is much more noisy than the RCM image. And if you then deconvolve the data sets, you can see that the, uh, the resolution is clearly not the same. 
since we have a higher uh, signal to noise ratio in the RCM, the deconvolution does a much better job. Therefore, you really see the resolution. So sensitivity is very important. Uh, that's uh, why we can uh, image uh, live cells also for a very long time. So here you see uh, living cells uh, stained from mitochondria. And uh, we image these cells for 61 hours, one frame every 10 seconds. So we acquire in total 22,000 images. And you can see these cells are completely happy. They don't bleach. They're not, uh, they're not, they're not, you, you don't kill them with this much laser light. And you can see they even, they even go in mitosis. So this demonstrates that they are completely fine with the, uh, with the laser light we're exposing them to. So we also measure the excitation light. This is something that uh, we would also highly recommend uh, people to do when doing live cell, live cell imaging. And for this specific experiment with 61 hours of imaging, uh, we used one microwatt of exposure at the sample surface, so after the objective at 561. So that's very, very little laser light. It's actually uh, about 10 to 20 times lower than you would use in a regular confocal. Uh, this is the same data set, but then uh, we did the deconvolution run by uh, Huygens. And here you can clearly see that uh, the contrast is much better. And also the resolution is much better. So just by doing this deconvolution step, which can be done after the imaging, you can obtain even sharper images. Okay, so multicolor is also possible. Just to illustrate it here, here we image some uh, cell with uh, blue ER, in green there's mitochondria, and in red there is a, a, a nuclear dye, which is uh, SIR DNA. So this probe emits in the far red. And because we use a camera, we can actually capture the signal. So we remember that with the uh, gas PMT, you will not capture this since it's in the far red. We can also do simultaneous acquisition of multiple colors. So the first, uh, the previous video I showed was uh, sequential acquisition. So therefore we can use the CAIRN multi-split and here we see that the device is coupled to the RCM and to the camera and it physically uh, cuts the camera in four zones. So and here is an example of uh, data being uh, imaged like uh, simultaneously. So uh, in this case, we have we had three three colors in uh, living neurons. Uh, I like this video very much since you can see all kinds of dynamics that are going on here. Um, you can see uh, if you start to zoom in, you can see that there's transport along uh, dendrites and axons, uh, which is uh, illustrated here. So you can, if you look at the red signal, you can see these blobs moving towards the nucleus. So this is clearly transport of some, uh, of some organelle. And you can see in, uh, in green, you can see even mit mitochondria are being trafficked along the dendrite. So if you zoom in, you can see this mitochondria moving very fast across the dendrite. And again, you can see that this, the, the cell is completely happy with the laser we are exposing them to. Okay, so because we have a camera-based uh, system, we can also work in bypass mode. So this is uh, showing you the two, two modes. So we have white field on the left side and convocal on the right side. And simply by switching this knob, it's a manual knob, you can uh, uh, you can go back and forth between the convocal and, uh, and the white field, so as to focus in the white field mode and to image in the convocal mode. I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation that we are very flexible, so we can reuse existing components. We fit to all the big four microscopes, also others we've tested. Um, then we have several cameras that we can use, and we can use multiple laser sources. So reusing existing components, that's our strong points. Uh, in terms of software, uh, we are integrated into NIS Elements, uh, Nikon software. We have a free of charge micromanager driver, and this is uh, open source. So that controls any microscope. 
And um, Velocity, what we're going to uh, show today, is actually a program that also uh, can control many different types of microscopes. So it's a nice tool to have, especially in a facility where there are multiple brands of microscopes. So you can re really use one program for the entire acquisition. Um, in terms of uh, image processing, we have uh, a tool for SVI Huygens, and we have uh, we are integrated into microvolution. So this is on the fly deconvolution in both uh, micromanager and velocity. So here we uh, are going to see some examples of uh, systems that we have installed. So this is uh, a Leica DMI8, and to the left board we have a uh, the PCO camera and the RCM. Then we have a system at John Hopkins University. So this is a, a size Axio observer. And again, on the left side, the RCM. Here we have a system at uh, ETH in Zurich, Switzerland. And here they have a Nikon TI2 with, uh, on the right-hand side, uh, a 3D adaptive optics module from uh, a Mick AL. And what they do is they make 3D storm, opt, uh, 3D storm images and they correlate them with the convocal data on the left side. So there's a very nice and complex system. Uh, so for the images, uh, the lifestyle images I took, I used this microscope, which is an Olympus IX83. And we have a cool LED wide field illumination unit and then on the left-hand side, you can see the RCM, the multi-split, and the camera. And uh, above that, you can see a Tokai Hitch stage stop incubation system, which fits all microscopes as well. And then we have a Toptica four-channel laser combiner. We also fit two upright microscopes. So here you see we raise the level, we raise the RCM to the level of the C mount. And we have another product, which is the RCM Near Infrared, so NIR. And this unit uses 640 and 785 lasers for excitation. And this is especially useful if you would like to image a really deep into tissues. Uh, so here we have um, a housefly being imaged with 785 at 20x on the left side and 100x zoomed in image in the indicated region where you can see all kinds of nice, nice details. Um, and at 785, the rescanning principle also works. So we get 40% better resolution over a regular confocal system. So for today, I will use a, a Nikon TIE microscope with a, a Hamamatsu Flash 4 and a Toptica CLE. And you can see this is all mounted on a regular table. So we don't, we don't necessarily need a uh, anti-vibration table as the system is very, uh, very robust. So to summarize my part, uh, the RCM is very sensitive. It's a super resolution technique. It's very easy to use, and it's also very affordable. So if you would like to know more, you can contact us at the uh, address below or contact your distributor. So I would like to give the hand back to Vincent. Yes, I'm back. So thank you, Jeroen, for this really nice presentation. Uh, I think now it's for uh, John Abacol to uh, present Quorum Technology. Great. Thanks, uh, Vincent. And hello, everyone. Uh, Quorum Technologies is a Canadian-owned company and has been integrating microscope-based imaging solutions for over 30 years. The company pioneered spinning disc confocal technology in Canada and developed the first solid-state laser engine to be used in the confocal market. A key part to our success over the years has been the Velocity software platform. Uh, Quorum was the Canadian distributor for Velocity for many years, and we were very excited to have the opportunity to acquire the platform from Perkin Elmer a few years ago. And one of the primary benefits of the software is the workflow efficiencies it provides to its users from acquiring images right through to visualizing and interrogating your data. The Velocity Library is unique um, as it holds all your experimental information in one place. This together with the flow between Velocity modules 
facilitates both efficiencies of use and a smooth path towards publication. Uh, we recently began working with Confocal NL and uh, are very thrilled to have the uh, integration with Velocity and the Rescan Confocal. These two products complement each other very nicely. And uh, with that being said, I will now pass things over to my colleague, Jeff Butler, who will provide you with a walkthrough of the software platform. So uh, Jeff, uh, over to you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you again for uh, joining us. Uh, I'm going to be doing uh, a bit of a live presentation of Velocity. Uh, as you can see here, I just have a live image uh, on the screen. Uh, and I'm just going to basically work through uh, how we see Velocity going from acquisition and then through restoration or our deconvolution module, then quantitation and visualization. As you can see uh, in here, uh, as John mentioned, you have the live image that I've got up on the screen, but then I can switch immediately to any of the acquired images that I've already uh, that I've already taken so that when you're working, you have a very smooth workflow between what you're doing right now and what you've actually reviewed uh, previously. So you can have uh, an organization in your library, as you can see here. If you click on any of the folders, you can see the contents of those folders. So you can essentially organize your library in any way that makes sense to you, either by date or by project, uh, or uh, any other sort of organization that, that helps you understand and group your data in, in, a, in an effective manner. So the acquisition interface is actually quite simple. You can see here on the left, I've got my camera uh, at the central image, which is the uh, image that I'm basically viewing right now. And then I have all of my hardware down the right-hand side. I've got a very simple setup today but you can see that I can have clusters for each of my hardware sections, and I can show or hide those. I can control each of the components in this hardware, so I can change things like my exposure time. And, uh, and I can uh, also take a look at clusters of information. So one of the things you often wanna do in any kind of experiment is you wanna change a number of parameters at one time. So you can see here, I basically have uh, my excitation emission filters uh, that change at the same time. So I basically have these light paths set up so that I can change a cluster of hardware components all at once. To take an image in velocity, it's a very, it's a very simple uh, process. I can simply hit the space bar and you can see that I get uh, an image that shows up in the library. Uh, the other thing that I can do is if I'm in my video preview, you're often wanting to do more complex acquisitions. So I just go into my acquisition, acquisition setup. Here you can see I've got this set up for a simple two uh, color acquisition. I also have options for changing my focus with uh, changing my focus with the focus drive so I can do my Z stacks. I can uh, manage my shutters for a variety of different acquisitions. I can add on things like time courses, multi-point acquisition, and also doing things like stitching. I also have an option for a software-based autofocus uh, that you can basically include in the system uh, so you can actually do an autofocus uh, if you're doing a time course. So all of that is fairly straightforward. Once you do, once you've configured your acquisition, you can just hit the record button. And in this case, I'm simply gonna be doing a simple two channel snap and you can see it drops it into the library. Once you've acquired an image, you're in a position where you can go in, review it. You can see here, I've got it in an orthogonal view so I can move through this in Z. And you can see that I have the crosshairs showing my, uh, showing my image in uh, the XY, the XZ and the YZ view. Uh, and I can also move between different modalities. These include things like simple XY plane. So if I take a look at this, uh, then I have options for taking a look at each of the channels. So I can look at each of the channels alone and then the common overlay. Once you've acquired data, it's often uh, very useful for you to do a deconvolution on, on the data set. So you can see here, this is a simple wide field acquisition that I've done previously. Uh, 
And once you've created a set of point spread function, point spread functions for each of your wavelengths and for each of your objectives, you're in a position where you can then just go in and do an iterative restoration. You simply apply the appropriate point spread function to each of the channels that you're working with, and then you can click start and it'll actually uh, do your full image. Um, this also includes an option for microvolution, which is the GPU based uh, deconvolution system that we have. So you can do very, very fast deconvolutions uh, as well as the conventional deconvolution. Once you've done that decon, you can see that you often get a very dramatic improvement in the image quality. As you can see here, where I'm taking a look at through the same image, uh, and you can see that you just get a, a very substantial improvement with the, with the deconvolution. Once you've uh, been working with your data, you often want to then go into the measurements. And again, here we just have to click on the measurements tab. Um, we have a very simple interface. We have a series of, of, uh, series of uh, protocols that we can utilize. Uh, you build it, each of these simple protocols into a more complicated protocol, and then it will show the data. So if I do something very simple, like bring in find objects, Velocity will automatically find all of the objects based on Otsu's method. I can then do things like have contrasting feedback options so that you can see what objects you've identified. If I choose to, I can zoom in. And you can see here, because I'm using contrasting colors that I've actually had these two nuclei identified as a single object. So then I have other, uh, uh, other functionalities like separate touching objects where I can split those objects based on a size guide. And you can see here, now I have two different objects that are in place. And you can see all of the objects that are now identified in the spreadsheet below. Once you've identified all of the objects, you're happy with the protocol, you can then create a measurement item and this will save all of your measurements And this goes into your library as well. So now you have that spreadsheet. If I double click here, I can have that spreadsheet open and have a window showing you the uh, live image. And you can see here, I always have a connection between the measurement item that I've made uh, and the actual image that I've acquired. So it's easy for you to review your data uh, with uh, your colleagues and understand what's going on. In addition, in the measurements functionality, uh, you can actually have multiple populations. So if I have made a protocol that I'm happy with, I wanna use it multiple times, I can just restore that protocol. And you can see here that I've now identified multiple, uh, multiple populations, including uh, the nuclei and the items contained within it. So you can actually see that I've done, um, I've actually done uh, compartmentalization and a measurement of distance. So you can actually see the distance from the nuclei to each of the green punctae. So you can do fairly complicated uh, analyses of the populations that you're working with within your image. Once you've done that, you want to be in a position where you can actually take a look at that data. So if I now switch to the 3D opacity view, which is our 3D rendering program, you can see that I've got those objects. I'm just going to change my feedback options here. You'll notice that I have a variety of different feedback options. So there, I'm just going to be showing the outline. Oops. Sorry, the bounding box is what I want here. And now when I go into the image, I can actually see those objects and the relationships inside. And I can take a look at it from any angle. So you have a very powerful tool for understanding the relationships within all of the objects within your field. So you can have a relationship between all of the populations. The 
3D rendering view of velocity is quite powerful for taking a look at a variety of, uh, taking a look at your data as well. So if I just go in here for making something very dramatic, I can zoom in, I can do a rotation, and then I can even do things like a fly through the object. Do my rotation and then zoom back out. All of this can, of course, be recorded as you're doing these things. So we have a series of bookmark functionalities that allow you to uh, save all of these transitions, and those can be exported as, uh, as a movie as well. So that pretty much concludes my presentation for Velocity. Uh, and uh, I look forward to any questions you might have. Uh, and uh, I will pass the uh, presentation back to Vincent and uh, Yaron for uh, their portion of the uh, presentation again. Hi, Jeff. Thank you so much. Uh, Yaron, this is your turn to, uh, to demo the RCM. Yep. Let's do it. So I'm going to turn my screen share on. Here we go. So um, yeah, so this is uh, the velocity environment. Uh, Jeff just showed you uh, a couple of things that are also applicable to, to the story that I'm going to tell. So what I want to do is just take you through the, uh, the process of acquiring an RCM image uh, in velocity. So if we look here, we can see uh, we have the uh, the panel for uh, changing the light path. So here I have some, uh, here I made some options uh, for using the bypass mode in side three and GFP channel. And then I have here four laser lines. So 405, 488, 561, and 640. So the general workflow is that a uh, user uh, goes in the bypass mode. And now I should get immediate feedback already from the camera. So here we can see there's an object. It's a bit faint, so why not move to a, to a different location? So remember that this is still a, a white field, what we're seeing here. I can also move in, a, for example, the GFP channel. And we can see we have some very nice uh, neurons here in this sample. Um, I'm just looking now for the cell body, which is the the thick part of the cell, let's say here, which looks quite nice. And what I can do is I can uh, set up a C stack. So I can go to my uh, Nikon controls here and go in the focus drive. And here I have the option to uh, set the bottom and top position. That's what most of the users will do. So we can go to the bottom and then say set bottom. And now I go to the top position and I can say, okay, this is the, this is the top position of the cell. And now you can see in total, I have eight micrometer of volume. Alternatively, you could say I take a plane and I say set zero and then measure a certain distance around that volume. So that's also a possibility. Okay. So right now I'm ready to switch in the RCM mode. Um, just to set up the experiment, I can right click anywhere in my image and this will give me the acquisition setup option. Alternatively, you can double click here on this icon to uh, get this window. And this is where I can uh, set up my Z stack. So you see, I have uh, three channels that I would like to image. Uh, I use the Nikon focus drive and with 200 nanometer spacing. So this ge would generate a very nice uh, 3D um, volume of the uh, of this neuron. Um, yeah, Jeff covered all these points. So here you can do time experiments, points, and uh, stitching as well. But for now, we want to make a Z stack of this uh, of this of this cell. So I can hit OK. Um, I have to open a library as well. So this is where the images will be stored. I already made one here. 
Um, so meanwhile, while it's imaging, I can uh, show you some images we already obtained before. So I now just switch the unit back into RCM mode and I'm ready to run my protocol. Well, let's first first just snap one image to see if it if the if the microscope is giving me the the image that I want. Yes, so this is just the top of the cell. And what I can do, since uh, I'm only exposing a part of my uh, camera, I can expose the entire camera as well, but this will take a longer time. So I'm gonna expose only the center and then crop out the center. Okay, so now I'm ready to run the experiment. And you see here generated an empty file and here the raw data is coming in. So you can see I'm just checking if it's uh, if it's doing the thing I want I wanted to do. So right now it's it's four and a half micrometer. Uh, might be might be a little bit off. Let me go back once. So I stop the experiment and I switch back into the bypass mode to adjust my uh, Z stack. Um, let me see. Here we go. Yeah, so it, it started out of focus a little bit. Um, I want to be in this mode here. And I could say set zero. And we want to start here. Yeah, and then I move up up to here. Okay, so again, eight micrometer, that makes sense. Move back into the RCM mode and run the experiment protocol. Yeah, this looks more like a one. So now it's starting at the, at the bottom of the image. Uh, I will show you later. Uh, so now, now this is just acquiring. I will show you later how this data set looks like. Um, meanwhile, I can show some uh, some some wide field images of uh, of of pollen grains that we obtained. So this is uh, actually a quite nice sample where you can look at autofluorescence, and this will demonstrate very nicely uh, of having uh, a convocal. So this is. White field data, you can see it's very blurry in the Z direction, especially. So here you see the YZ and the XZ overview. And you can see that I you can really easily navigate around uh, as long as I have this tool selected. And what I can also do is pull up my uh, slicer overview. And if I move through here, you can see it will nicely slice my data and I can visualize it from any direction I want. So I really like this, uh, this, this environment. It really gives you a lot of flexibility. So we also took this in the RCM mode, of course, and this is the uh, RCM image of the same sample. So you can see it's uh, much sharper than, uh, than the original image, than the white field image. So you can observe all kinds of details. If you uh, look closely here, for example, you can see these uh, nice structure in, in, the, in the pollen. And again, when you navigate through it, you can observe the, the 3D structure as well. So this was done using a 488 laser. So you have a lot of scattering, especially uh, if you go deeper in the, in the sample. But if you use longer uh, emission wavelengths, you will have uh, a much, uh, much better penetration depth. So this can also be uh, volume rendered. Like Jeff already showed. Oops. Here we go. And then I can move around that. So here you can really observe the 3D structure of the of the specimen. So let's see how we're doing with the uh, stack. Ah, you can see it's almost at the top now. So you still see some of this uh, structure here.
So regarding the RCM controls, it's also quite an important thing, of course. So here we can see uh, the RCM controls that we have within Velocity. Uh, you can see here is the laser selection. Since it's now scanning, it's automatically switching between laser lines. Um, here you have control over the output of each laser. Uh, this is the field of view of the camera. So you can see we have uh, multiple uh, fields of view that I can select. And based upon the uh, field of view, uh, you adjust your speed. So 1024 pixels is roughly uh, two seconds per frame. 512 pixels is roughly one second per frame. And 256 is roughly half a second per frame. Then here's a slider that uh, lets you control the sweep factor of the, of the microscope. So since we have two uh, scanners, we can say, I want to do a double sweep for super resolution, or I want to do a single sweep. And a single sweep will then give you a much, uh, much bigger field of view. So you can have four times the field of view, or you can have a uh, super resolution. So you can choose between these, these two modes, and that's very nice. So our data is uh, captured. You can see the data is here. And this is the 3D rendering already. So this goes very fast. Um, of course, we will have three channels. So I'll just show you how to uh, adjust the uh, lookup tables for each channel as well. So you can see we now pretty much only see the green. Um, let's um, adjust that. So in the image tab, there is, uh, let me see, there is the, oh, I'm sorry, the tools tab, there is the um, contrast enhancement tool. So this allows you to set the minimum and maximum value for each channel. And then when you're done, you can simply just click on enhance. So let's do it for the other channels as well, 561. This one is a bit weaker in terms of staining, but still we can uh, we can visualize some structure. It's indicated in yellow here. And we have a red channel, 640. And here you can now clearly see the uh, the overlay of the two of the three channels, and you can uh, slice through it with these uh, with the slice viewer. And you can nicely observe the Z resolution of the system. So this was about an eight micrometer stack. And if we pull up this window, we can see the slicer in action. And if you move back to the other tab here, you can slice through your sample like this. Alternatively, you can use the 3D opacity view, and this really gives you the, the three-dimensional structure, and you can walk around it, make nice movies in the, in the built-in movie maker as well. So this brings me pretty much to the end of, the, of this uh, demo of the RCM and Velocity. Uh, remember that Velocity is um, is a program that can control any microscope. So this is what I personally really like is that you have one program which covers uh, the control of a Nikon system or a Zeiss system or Olympus or Leica. So that's that, that's pretty cool that you can do all these things at once. Okay, with this, uh, I would like to stop, give the, uh, the word back to Vincent. Thank you, Jeroen. It was a really nice uh, presentation uh, and demo. So um, now is the time for the question and answers. We're actually perfectly on time. We have 10 minutes for this. So if you have any questions, please go for it. And in the meantime, we already had a few questions from uh, Cedric Espinel. So the first one was about the, uh, is the RCM compatible with a LED combiner? And uh, the answer is no, it, it, it only works with, uh, with um, a laser combiner. Um, the second question was about the cap compatibility with the Amamatsu Wave Gemini. Uh, so I guess this is to compare with the uh, multi-split that uh, Yeroen chose during its presentation. So the multi-split is an image splitter. So we can perform uh, simultaneous multicolor acquisition. With a multi-split, you can perform up to four multicolor, I mean, up to four colors acquisition at the same time. 
I basically split the image in four. With the wave view Gemini, you can do up to two colors at the same time. So it split the field of view into two rectangular areas. Uh, in terms of compatibility, in terms of compatibility, sorry, yes, it has been tested and it works. So the third question was about the um, compatibility with the 25 millimeter. I mean, with a big, uh, large field of view offered by the Nikon Ti2, uh, which is 25 millimeter. So you won't tell me if I'm wrong, but I, I think the RCM is only compatible with 18 millimeter. Yeah, uh, correct. So at the moment, we uh, we use, utilize the C mount, which is the uh, the mount for uh, for 18 or 19 millimeter uh, field of view. Correct. So yes. this is something we're definitely looking into to be compatible with these systems as well, to get obtain the uh, uh, the full field of view of these microscopes. Yeah. That said, if you use a multi-split, you can still use a, a big chip camera, uh, typically compatible with 25 millimeter field of view, uh, because the scan area will be the same, but thanks to the image splitter, we'll be able to scan a bigger area, uh, up to uh, 2048 by 2048 pixels. We have a new question from Cedric. Uh, could we do something like a fast stitch of a full tissue? So you won't tell me if I'm wrong, but that's a nice thing with the RCM. Uh, there is this um, this uh, wide field capability using the bypass. So yes, you can do. Uh, I guess I mean that's yeah. that's a guess, but yeah, I think so you can do a fast stitch. Yeah, yeah. For it. So so the, the the RCM is also integrated in this elements, and if you uh, if you can do stitching there, then you will also be able to do it with the camera. Uh, in both the wide field and the convocal mode. Of course, the convocal mode is a bit slower. If you want to just want to obtain a, a large field of view and stitch it, I would recommend doing it in wide field. And if you need more higher resolution, then you can do uh, convocal stitching as well. The RCM just serves as, serves as a camera detector. So in terms of uh, of speed, we need to keep in mind 512 by 512 is about one frame per second. And then if you increase, it gets uh, uh, slowlier. If you reduce the field of view, it gets faster. Correct. Is there any any other questions? Maybe wait one or two more minutes. If you have any question, that's the moment to go. In any case, we'll uh, uh, share. I mean, we have recorded this webinar, so we'll share that with you. And uh, if you have more questions, please feel free to contact us in the future, um, whether Chrome Technologies or myself. In terms of price, yes. Uh, so I can I can only answer um, in uh, in USD in the US, uh, but the the orange box, so the RCM, the confocal unit is about 40,000 USD, including the bypass module. Uh, then to that, you have to, uh, to add a camera and a laser combiner. So let's say that you already have a wide field microscope. You can count about 90,000 USD for the confocal unit with a bypass, a uh, good SCMOS camera, uh, 2K by 2K, and a four laser line combiner. And this is without the multi-speed. If you have any other questions. Thank you, Cedric. Nice questions. OK, let's maybe wait uh, one more minute. Uh, and if we don't have questions, then we will, uh, we will uh, stop the webinar. No more questions. Okay, it sounds it sounds that uh, we uh, your presentation was uh, so clear that we we are good. good. 
That's good. That's good. <laughs> Perfect. So okay. thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And if again, if you have any more questions in the future, please feel free to reach out to uh, to Axiom Optics or to Quorum Technologies. Okay. Bye bye. Or to Confluent in Europe. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.